very much. I'm excited to be the inaugural speaker of Discovery Cafe. I appreciate being invited. What you see there is really not remarkable on the face of it, right? It's just an aisle in a grocery store. I show the picture because it's sort of representative of our general food environment, one of relative ubiquity. We have food around us all the time, forcing us to make choices about food, what we eat, how much, how often, where, when, um, pretty much every moment of our lives. So you can think of places you go to do things other than buy food. Go to Staples, maybe to buy Staples, right? <laughs> and still, you have to pass by racks of food. So you have to make food choices almost wherever you go in our uh, consumer-saturated environment. So particular flavors are maximized in our food environment. Now, humans innately prefer sweet foods. We learn quickly to enjoy salty and high-fat foods. Can you guess why? Survival. All of these things are metabolically important. So between 1994 and 2004, um, over 1,600 new types of candies were introduced to the market in the U.S. During that same period of time, that same decade, about 52 new fruit and vegetable products were introduced during the same period of time. So food industry is savvy. It knows what we want to be eating, and so it knows where to innovate foods. And it's foods that will um, highlight sweet, salty, and fat. So variety is another interesting factor that tends to be maximized in our food environment. We eat more when variety is in front of us. When you have lots of different foods in front of you, you like to pick at all these different little things because you want to try it all. But then all of a sudden, you look down and you've got this mound of food on your plate. Okay, so this happens in animals as well. Researchers took genetically identical rats, took one group, and they fed them this diet here, which is sort of a standard pelleted diet for, for rodents. Then they took another group of rats, and they fed them this, which is that pelleted diet plus literally chocolate and peanut butter, Cheetos, Oreos, all sorts of other stuff. And they let them eat ad libitum for a period of weeks, and they looked to see what would happen. And literally, this is what happened. They overate. All of their satiation mechanisms were absolutely overrun. And they continued to overconsume, overconsume, and they became obese. The effect of diet and that variety and the maximization of those flavors was really impactful in this study as well. We know that portions have been increasing in all sorts of ways for a very long time. This is one of my favorite examples, the 7-Up Gulp. They started with the gulp, which was 16 ounces. Then they went to the big gulp, which is double that. Then they went to the super big gulp. Then they went to the extreme gulp, which required a handle to hold it. And then finally, really anticlimactically, they went to the double gulp. But that's 64 ounces of, if you think of a sugary beverage, that's phenomenal. Science and government both are trying to get messages out there about how to eat well. Nutrition education is important, but it's absolutely ineffective, almost worthless without environmental change to support it. And the reason is, Advertisement. Advertisement trumps whatever nutrition messages we're trying to get out there. And there's a reason why. In the early 1900s, we used to use up to about half, nearly half, of our take-home income on buying food. Fast forward to the early 2000s, we only spend about 13% of our take-home income on food, which means food companies are becoming ever more competitive for your food dollar. Right? So they have to become more savvy when it comes to their advertising. They have to become more pervasive if they want to survive. Their profit margins are razor thin. Americans consume 124 kilograms on average of meat per person per year. But if you compare our consumption to the average consumption worldwide, it's about 46.6 kilograms per person. So we eat a lot of meat. Why is this a problem? Meat is really, really resource intensive. Livestock consume seven times the grain that people do. Okay, so they require a lot of grain to grow all of that meat. Last year we produced 10, of the, 10 billion of the 23 billion bushels of corn produced worldwide. Livestock, both here and abroad, consumed 80% of all the corn that we produced. To take that one step further and you think about the greenhouse gases produced when you're using all of those fossil fuel um, resources. So this shows CO2 produced per pound of food product pr produced. The biggest red bar there, right there, that's beef. 20 pounds of CO2 are produced for every pound of beef produced. Right, so the, the difference in greenhouse gas emissions is really important and impactful as well. So how do we deal with these relatively significant issues? You need to think about a whole food system approach so that we think about resource input. We think about waste streams. We do think also about consumption and health, but we put all of that together. Now, we've been pretty hardcore consumers for a really long time. And depending on corporations, when it comes to food, to understand our food, they have to tell us what our food is, what's in it, how healthy it is, right? If we become a bit distrustful of corporations, maybe it makes sense then that we'd want to go local because we begin to develop relationships with local farmers. We know where our food is coming from. We've wrested control of our consumerism away from big companies. And maybe now we're, you know, 
taking more control of our dollar by spending it locally. There's a new model out there called Food Hubs, and this is an interesting model of marrying the distribution and logistical capacity of larger food companies with small and mid-sized farms and their production practices. Basically what it does, a food hub, is aggregates a lot of local food to create volume. So there are novel models um, that are now emerging in the local foods arena um, that could be even more sustainable, even more impactful when it comes to food availability, food security, and so forth.